Hello, welcome to the Combo Club. I am your host, Andrew Payne. And with me today, as always, is my co-host, Amanda Comey. I had a brain fart there, Amanda. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. I've been having brain farts a lot recently, uh, so I can relate. All right. So, Amanda, before we get into Spider-Man Life Story, I, this is actually kind of a preview on, what we're, on, on our next book, in a way, right? So... Amanda, do you watch The Mandalorian? I do not. And I, why don't you? I don't give money to Disney right now. Why don't you give money to Disney right now? I'm, I'm now I'm interested. Um, I just uh, I I I don't think they need it, you know. Oh, uh, okay, sure. Look, you know what? No, no judgment here. It just. Like I said, it's always funny. It's always funny when you take, like, the hard stance and me. I'm just like, you know what I think the difference is between me and you, Amanda, sometimes? Is that, like, my money has slaves on, slave owners on it. So, <laughs> so like, nothing bothers me, if that make any sense. Like, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's always hard for me to be morally outraged at anything because literally everything I do. Like, it's, it's, no, not, it's not moral outrage. It's just I don't feel like paying for it. <laughs> it's 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 sheer laziness like it's like oh wait in order for me to have disney prime or disney plus or whatever i need to walk across the room and get my credit card number and stick it no oh. no that's oh, way okay. too hard and then you also you don't own any of the stuff right oh, so I it's so it's not credit. like yeah no so it's it's you know it's a little bit that i don't think disney deserves the money but like mostly it's just like i don't need another thing you know I feel, you. I feel you. Now, CBS is the one where I have a moral stance. I'm not paying them for Star Trek. But you know you want to watch Star Trek. I don't even know why you're doing that to yourself. I I Cause... own I own the first season of Discovery. I would rather just buy it than pay for CBS's stupid streaming platform. So you know what you know what I I haven't watched any of Discovery and I've been meaning to and I haven't even watched Picard. I'm a bad Star Trek fan. I wonder if I actually buy it would I would I watch it because I like I spent money on it. Um, I you know I will say that when I bought the first season of Discovery, it cost less than it would have to pay for the streaming for the whole time that the episodes were coming out. How much are the episodes? Do, do, do they charge for the episodes? No, as, no, as you as have as? to you have to get the subscription, and I believe they also put in a cooling off period so that if you cancel, you have to wait a month or two before you can like rejoin, because they were having people sign up for Star Trek, and then when it like went on break, people were canceling, and they want people to keep the subscription through. Oh, so wow! You, so I, I, so you can't even buy them while it's streaming, new, huh? No, no. You and there are commercials still, I believe. Ugh. Yeah, no, no. It's it's like offensively bad. It may have changed since they first started, but the first season of Discovery coming out—that is what was being reported on uh, all of the Star Trek subreddits was that CBS was quite. Uh, quite severe they're they're very very inspired to try and make cbs all access happen is what they were doing you see i'm more really outraged on that just for the simple fact they don't have shit out like at least disney has like your memories <laughs> yes and your childhood right and they do produce a lot of awesome new stuff what the hell is on CB, CBS? That I don't want to watch Two and a Half Man. Right. Like you know, I just I am outraged. Like that. It look, I'm upset for you now. You just made me mad. I did not know that. I thought, well, if you can buy them, okay. But yeah. So anyway. <laughs> so did you watch the Clone Wars? Yes. All right, so you know who Ahsoka is. Yes. So our, she, our, uh, our girl who makes the prequels almost worth it. Yes, yeah. Who was originally hated because she was terrible at first. Yes, then, yes. Then, like, George Lucas... Because, like, then, like, George Lucas kind of, like, went away from Clone Wars, and Dave only took fully over, and, you know, he made her, you know, a good character. Um, She made her premiere in live action in The Mandalorian. 
That is really cool. I know that yep. people were um, during Solo and Rogue One, I know that people were combing the background of every single scene, wondering if she was in it, right? Right, right, exactly. And she's in it. Like, she's in it, in it, right? Like, she's, like, standing there talking to you in it. She's in it. She uses her lightsaber. She she murders people. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she fucking tossed the baby Yoda. Excuse Whoa. me. Wow, wow. Excuse me. He has a name now. Okay. It's Gorgu. Gorgu. Yeah, it's terrible. Sell Look, me some toys. Gorgu. Okay. Got it. It's, it's a terrible name. So look, have you seen Baby Yoda? I have I am familiar with the phenomenon of Baby Yoda. I feel like you couldn't not be. Okay. My wife loves Baby Yoda, but she refuses to watch The Mandalorian. I mean, I know people who are obsessed with Minions who never watched any of those cartoons. Exactly. So it's the same thing. Yeah. So I, so when I told her like, oh, he has a name now, she said, "What is it? Like, it's Gorgu." Say no, it's Baby Yoda, and she, and she, <laughs> she, and she has rejected that name. And apparently, a lot of people have rejected this name. Me personally, I just think it's gets some getting used to. And like, I don't know what they see. The thing, the problem is, no matter what they named him, was never going to be good enough. Yeah. Be Unless he was, unless his name was Yoda Junior, <laughs> whatever his name was going to be was never going to be good enough for anybody. Like you know what I'm saying? You can name him Yodel, like 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 something. <laughs> and no, it's Gorgu. It's, it's it's little baby Gorgu. He's adorable. But no, Ahsoka Tano is in there. She actually name drops somebody who we're gonna become very familiar with in the next couple of weeks. She actually name drops Grand Admiral Thrawn. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, does does that mean Sabine isn't far behind? Does that mean like Ezra might show up from Rebels? Have you seen Rebels? Rebels is really good too. No, I haven't. Oh, uh, you 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 have to like watch like Rebels. Like that's that's a really good show. I can't stress that enough. Get made by the same people who made the Clone Wars. So you know, so there's that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like Ahsoka. Is in Rebels, like, like heavily, like she almost became like she, she, like I think in season two or three she becomes like a main character in that show also. So like, you know, Dave, Dave, you're on the the, the showrunner, executive producer with John Farrow. I think he's just gonna bring over his whole universe from the cartoons. Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Oh, uh, also, Ahsoka Tone was played by Rosario Dawson. Ooh. Who does a very good job as a Soka. Like, you know, her voice is a little different because you know it's a different actress, but I think I think she does a pretty good job. I think um when I think of Rosario Dawson, I think like she has like a very strong like jaw and like face, like kind of statuesque almost. Right. Yes. I think that's I think that's right for this character. I really like that. It's yeah, she she was really damn good. And it was like it's the only like 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 I've had this like, you know, I don't have this feeling often, but it's almost like watching the Ninja Turtles come to life for the first time. Like I'm just looking at the screen like I can't believe she's a real person now. <laughs> like, like like you know what I'm saying? It's, it's one of those moments like, whoa, shit. Anyway, it was a good episode. I highly suggest Mandalorian. If you didn't like the sequel movies, I think the Mandalorian, I think the Mandalorian makes up for the sequel movies. Interesting. Like, like I just seen a woman today is talking about like imagine what we what what what, what sequels we would have got if the Mandalorian would have came out first. It's like whatever the formula is for Star Wars, this show has figured it out. And I think we're going to talk a lot about Star Wars next week. You know what I'm saying? But it, it goes back to something you said, like, like in that conversation, that, that hour and a half conversation, I had to cut out the show because it's way <laughs> too long. Like, I, and, and it killed me to do it. You know what I'm saying? But um, 
you said like instead of trying to make it heady, like would it just be better if it was just like a silly space show? And you know what, Amanda? I think it's just better as a silly space as a silly space thing instead instead of trying to make it heady. Anyway. Enough of that. Is there any other news you want to talk about, Amanda? Anything else? Um, well, I mean, I, I think I mentioned before we got started, uh, there's some construction going on in my friend's condo, and it's <laughs> low, low grade, annoying, and uh, she texted me about it, and that was kind of the only thing that's happened in my life today, so. Look, look, man, look, look, look. Well, well, look, the, the, the pandemic affects all of us different. With that being said, <laughs> we, are, we are talking Spider Man Life Story, written by, published by Marvel, written by Chip Zardowski, and art by who, in my opinion, is the premier Spider Man artist, Mark Bagley. This is a comic that consists of six issues. It ran from March of 2019 to August of 2019. Um, it won an Osmond. The, the, the final issue won an Osmond for best single issue of a comic. And it reads Spider Man makes history. In 1962, Amazing Fantasy 15, 15 year old Peter Parker was bitten by a radioactive spider and became the amazing Spider Man. 57 years has passed in the real world since that event. So, what would happen if the same amount of time passed for Peter? To celebrate Marvel's 80th anniversary, Chip Zdarsky and Spider-Man legend Mark Bagley unite to spin a unique Spider-Man tale, telling an, tell an, an entire history of Spider-Man from beginning to end, set against key events of the decades through which he lived, from the Vietnam War to the Secret Wars and Civil War, all the way through what just might be a 72-year-old Spider-Man's final mission. Prepare to watch Peter Parker age through 57 years of groundbreaking history and found out what happens to him and those he loved the most. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Amanda, Spider-Man Life Story. What do you think of it? Please talk for a long time. I gotta catch my breath. Uh, so, I really enjoyed reading this. Um, it reminded me very, very much of the Alex Ross Marvels that we read about this time last year. Um, right. if you can believe it's been a year already, just in the sense that it sort of, um, followed, followed the Marvel universe, supposing it happened in real time and sort of trying to plausibly link some of the more famous stories together into, into a, a you know, into a narrative where they, they may have all actually happened. Um, right. So, yeah, it reminded me of that, which means, you know, we're, we're, I'm coming from a hard place if I, I'm comparing it to Alex Ross. Um, but I feel like I would be more likely to recommend this story. Um, I think that the art was just amazing. The layouts were great. Um, I think this had... I think this had more of a street level emotional story. And I think that maybe the Alex Ross version felt a little too epic for Marvel. Mm. Um, and there were a few cute creative decisions in here that were a little bit surprising and a little bit fun. Um, yeah, it was just very enjoyable and it was, it's just, it's so unique to, um, you know, get like a Marvel story that you can read start to finish that's self-contained like this. Right. We've, right. Re we've read, we've read a lot of DC books that have this structure, like Long Halloween was like this. Um, Marvel doesn't really do that quite as often. Um so I guess those are my main observations. So yeah, just just off the top of my head, it compares favorably to that Alex Ross Alex Ross book. Uh, but I thought it was even more accessible, and that the art was even more enjoyable. Um, 
kind of a street level story. Hopefully you've caught your breath. Did you have any, were, were your basic reactions any different than that? Oh, I love this shit. Like every, every single bit of it. I love this, man. It's, um, you know, the, the fun of a story like this, right? Is seeing in what Zardusky is going to, what famous stories he's actually going to fit in, what famous stories is he going to leave out, and what and the stories he do leave in, how is he going to remiss it to make it make sense within the actual, you know, linear timeline. Yeah, it's kind of, um, this is a weird metaphor. It's kind of like loading a dishwasher. Okay. Where it's like, you know what all of the things are that you need to fit in the dishwasher, but it's like, how is he going to stick them all in there so he can wash them all in one story? Right. And it's kind of ingenious how many pieces he can fit together in there. Um, very efficient sorting of the dishwasher. Love it, Mr. Zardsky. Great work. <laughs> and I love the fact that like he takes a slightly realistic approach and not because you know it's like some edge lord shit where he's trying to make the heroes seem like assholes or jerks it just it makes sense within this story you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like you know yes yeah, sue like if this was real and there's on the linear timeline yes yeah, sue may actually leave um reed richards for the way he is that was like, I, I want to say that the version, in addition to getting this version of Spider-Man, it feels like Zardsky also created the alternate versions of all of the other characters. Right. And that if Marvel had enough money, we could have gotten um, the Fantastic Four version of this book and the Iron Man version of this book. Right. Um. And the Captain America version of this book. Like, it feels like he kind of thought through the comparable moves in their stories. Yeah, and like, it seems like if he was taking a more realistic approach, he looked at these characters, I think, in the more realistic prism. Not too realistic, again, like I said, but just enough. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, oh, it's the Vietnam War. Tony would totally be down to being the Vietnam War, right? Yes. Wow. Wow. Captain America be like, nah. <laughs> you know, so like it's it's real interesting. Like, so like it seems like for each decade, he fits a a famous story from a famous Spider Man story from that decade into the story. Sometimes more. But it seems like that's what he tries to do, right? Yeah. So, like, for... So, like, for... Um, flat, so, for, like, the 60s, right? Just off the top of my head. It's the Green Goblin reveal. Which which is very different in the book. You know, which is very different in the regular Marvel Universe. But it's still there. Like, for the 70s, it's the death of Gwen Stacy. And the clone stuff. And, like, again, the death of Gwen Stacy doesn't happen like that in the, in the regular Marvel Universe. But it's still there, and it's still caused by the Green Goblin, even though in a more tragic, tragic way than even before. You know. Like, the Craven Last Hunt from the 80s. You know, like, like somehow they worked Venom in there. So there's... There's so much to pick through as a Spider-Man fan, as a person that's read these stories. Like, it's so damn cool to just um, look through all of it. So, uh, Amanda, what do you think about our protagonist, Peter Parker, in this story? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I really like this version of Peter Parker. I think that, uh, I mean, Chip Zardsky is practically a comedian. And I think that that really comes through in the way that he writes Peter, especially since a lot of comedians acknowledge that they come to humor through emotional trauma. And right. 
he sets both of that out in this character. So this is a this is a Spider-Man, a Peter Parker, who suffers a little bit and is definitely using humor to push through that in a proportional way, I would say. Um, and that sometimes he's funny and sometimes he's dad funny, which is the balance that I, I love for my Spider-Man. I, right. I want him to be clear. I want him to be funny in a nerdy way. Right. 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 So I, I love what they did with um, Mary Jane and Gwen. Cause I was thinking to myself, how are they going to do this? Exactly. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I was like, there, like there has to be a transition from Gwen to Mary Jane. And I was just like, how the fuck are they going to do this? Especially if he's married to Gwen and he's like 30. You know what I'm saying? Like, how they're going to do it? And, like, they do it in the most convoluted way possible, but it was perfect. You know what I'm saying? Just like, yeah, the Gwen you love is actually a clone. Your, your, your Gwen died. It's it, it just... I find... I actually find that to be the part of the story that works the least for me. Mm. Um, because I don't know, like, if I suddenly discovered that I was a clone, I don't know if it would really change my life. Right. And I am a little bit surprised that, and I mean, this is partially just for pacing in the story, but I'm a little bit surprised that, you know, they're sitting there going, oh, okay, so you're the clone and I'm the real guy. Okay, I guess the clone just has to go away now. <laughs> And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I feel like the resolution of that, which is implied to happen sort of off page. It, um, it, it's, it was like a year between. Like, I think, like, the revelation came in 78 and they left in 79. So we can assume it was about a year. So we don't know what happened in that year for them to, like, decide, um, like, all right, maybe you just should go. Yeah, but it that that's the one part where I felt like I couldn't really relate to the characters. Well, you know, right. the part where I find out that the lab where I've been working in, that my boss is secretly cloned uh, Norman Osborn, me and my husband. <laughs> you know, like one I does. Mean, I mean, look, honestly, I actually appreciate that they skipped over that because, like, there's some existential horror, sh horror shit to me. It's like, I got all these memories. I feel that it's like, I found out I was a clone, but I still love my son and wife. But like the real me is like, nah, they really ain't yours. They minds, you know, no matter how you feel, you can't have them. Like that would make me a super villain. I think like, I think I would have to kill my real self. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying yeah like, yeah like, because that's the thing right he has all his mirrors and all his feelings and like that seems that seems terrible on, on the level that I don't even want to think about because like you so said, the, the one the one thing that this led me to think about and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about Zardsky under, giving us sort of the, the pain and the humor is that at some level, maybe Peter Parker is running around working his ass off as Spider-Man, and maybe he's just really been looking for an excuse for a vacation. Right. And somebody shows up and says, hey, you know what? You're actually a clone, and you and clone Gwen Stacy can uh, go, you know, move to Chicago or whatever, do whatever you want to do, and... You cannot let anybody know that you're Spider-Man. And the real Spider-Man will still exist and he'll do just as good a job as you would have. Like that's like at some level, that's kind of amazing. Like, okay, so so I just said I, I don't know if I would change my life if somebody just told me I was a clone, but if somebody's told me that I could take a vacation from my life while somebody else managed it for me while I was gone, yeah, I might do that. That sounds great. 
And like the fact that he knew he like, you know, that, you know, they lied and say he wasn't, then he but he realized that he was, but he but he never told the clone Peter, because really he just wants to relax in the yeah. woods with his <laughs> wife and kids. <laughs> I think, uh, speaking of, like, his wife, I think Mary Jane is really good in this story. Like, Mary Jane being, like, like snoring cocaine at, club, at Studio 54 really fits her personality. <laughs> yeah, they had her as a DJ, right? Instead of, sometimes they, sometimes they have the girls in, like, bands or something, right? Right, right. Usually she's, like, a model slash actress. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that's in the same vein as this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So what did you think of Mary Jane? Um, I I mean I I liked this version of her, especially seeing sort of like like longitudinal, like like you were saying, seeing her being like way too cool in the '70s, and then seeing her be just like a mom in the 90s and the the knots um you know like I liked I liked seeing that and when we saw her older and when we saw her with the kids knowing that she had that background um was kind of fun it kind of I liked it um so who do you prefer Gwen or or Mary Jane? That that's the eternal question. It right? is. Um, I'm. I've always been an MJ fan. I've always been an MJ fan. Yeah. It is just it just because like just like within pop culture, you just get to spend more time with her since you know Gwen been dead since like seventy one. Um, it's very likely that I'm just more familiar with MJ. Um, I also feel like she's a more vibrant character maybe yeah I was gonna say I feel like she stands alone a little bit more but that may just be because she's been written more that way um but I just I feel like for the amount of time that Peter Parker spends with Spider-Man he's really got to be dating somebody who can handle him running off all the time. Right. Um, and I feel like MJ can handle herself. Um, although if we're really going to get into Spider-Man ships, I do kind of like Felicia Harding. I knew, I knew you was going to be like that. <laughs> I, I knew it was coming. I knew, I knew. Like, like it's... You know, for a nerd, Peter does pretty okay for himself. You know that? Uh-huh. <laughs> unbelievably so, by the way. I just want unbelievably so. But what's well, this? you don't suppose it's it's just like in Star Trek where they keep finding like scientists stranded on planets alone with their like gorgeously attractive research assistant <laughs> that Riker hits on. You know, it's like who possibly could be sitting in the writer's room writing a story about a decrepit old nerdy scientist hooking up with a young research assistant? I don't know who would come up with that idea. I don't know where these nerdy comic book writers come up with the idea that Spider-Man should be hooking up with all the hot ladies. You know what? I'm going to cut this out of the show. I was going to keep it, but I had to tell you this story at work, okay? Okay. So um, I'm a security guard. And, like, sometimes I work at the temperature check tent. Like, people drive up to get their temperature taken, right? And I work with this I work with this girl named Jazzy and this little old black lady, um, Miss Cynthia, right? I love Miss Cynthia. Miss Cynthia is, like, she got, like, three kids who are all grown now. But, like, she, she's like, oh, I used to watch Power Rangers with my kids. Oh, oh we used to watch Spider-Man. And she, could, and she could actually tell you a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And I tell her, i be going to conventions. She's like, ooh, when, 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 um, when, when the, um, when the pandemic goes away, I'm going to go to some conventions. People really be doing it. Like, yeah, Miss Cynthia, a little old black lady, sweet as can be, right? Okay. So, so, um, Jazzy, um, she a little woke, right? And she was talking about, like how nasty it is for like old men to be dating younger women. Mm-hmm. 
Now, you know, I, I, I have a stance against that as far as, like, I feel, I feel like if you both grown, I don't give a damn, right? I was, so, like, I was like, you know, I like, that's bullshit. She's like, what do you mean it's bullshit? We just playing around. I was like, I, I shouldn't have to date some old lady I just because I got to keep up appearances because what y'all think of me. If I'm rich and I can get me a 25-year-old and and, I, and I'm, like, 70, close to death, I'm going to get me a 25-year-old. Fuck y'all. And we all laughing, right? And mm-hmm. it's like, Miss Cynthia, tell him he wrong. And Miss Cynthia looked at her and like, Ashley, I agree with Jamil. Mm-hmm. I don't want no old man. Like, mm-hmm. like what, we gonna, what, what, what we both going to do? Take all our false teeth at night? Well, I don't want that. Like, <laughs> <thank> you, Miss- <laughs> <laughs> like thank you, Miss Cynthia. <laughs> it's like I was like, I was like, yeah, this ain't a man thing. If you're an older woman and you can get you some young dick, go right ahead. And we just laugh. But I just Miss Cynthia, sweet old Miss Cynthia, that was her answer. Like I don't want no old man either. <laughs> anyway, mm, mm. I have I have a a small. Um corollary to add to your theorem that it's it's cool for uh so anyways i believe there is a age difference so so when you're close in age it makes sense that your peers and you might be in a relationship and then as you get further apart in age it gets weird until it doesn't and then it starts feeling okay again (laughs) because i think Normally, when I think about situations where it feels weird for it to be like an older man with a younger woman, it's not like a 60-year-old guy getting like a 20-year-old trophy wife. It's like a 33-year-old guy dating like a 19-year-old girl. Yeah, that's... And it's like he's obviously doing it because no woman his age will talk to him. And And that's the situation where you've got to be like, oh, she's too young to know better. And yes, she's technically old enough to consent or something, but like, it feels weird. So I feel like there's like a, like, it might be like 15 years. So like, when you're the same age, it's cool. And once you get to about 15 years, it feels like really weird. And then as you get older than that, it's obvious that it's just like, you're fine. Well, you know what? I agree with that. That is weird. There's like the dudes that used to come pick up the girls. At my high school, the girls would be like 15 and 16, mm-hmm. and the dude is like 21, 22. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, technically they're not that far apart, but this seems really, really off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, I don't know. But like, once the age difference gets bigger, it's like, oh no, clearly we understand what's going on here. Right. Like, like to, it's like for me, right? It's always been like, it, it, it's transactional, right? You call it what you want, call it what mm-hmm. you will, right? But it's transactional. I remember people used to give, like, you know, um, what's his name? Playboy, what's his name? Hugh Hugh Hefner. Hefner. Yeah, a lot of shit, right? Because, like, he'll just, like, that nigga was, like, 75 year old, 75 years old with, like, these 21-year-old girls surrounding him, like, and, and women, especially women, and niggas that hate will be, like, they just with him for the money. You don't think you know that? You think you cares? Like he's about to die. Like, <laughs> like you think he gives a damn about they with him just for his money? Guess what? When he die, he can't take that shit with him. He shouldn't have to look at old saggy titties if, if, if he <laughs> choose not to. If he wants to, that's fine too. Yeah. But if he don't want to, he shouldn't have to. He has enough money. Why should he have to marry some old lady to make y'all feel better? This is how I feel. And Miss Cynthia agreed with me. <laughs> I uh, I will co-sign as well. <laughs> and again, I feel that way for men and women, honestly. Like, I really do. Mm-hmm. I, like, <laughs> if you can get you, if you like 50 and you can get you like a 22-year-old dude that, that make you feel young again, by God, you should do it. You should do it. Even if you're married, because you never probably get that chance again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Shit, I I, I don't completely lost where the hell we was at. Um, um, we were talking. We you got on this thread because I compared comic book writers putting oh yeah. Spider Man with hot women to Star yeah. Trek writers putting old scientists with young research assistants. Yeah, 
Uh, but whatever you do, don't leave him around Riker because he's definitely a date rapist. Now I'm just playing. I love Riker. I love Riker so much. Uh, that's you know watching clips of him Picard with him settled down. It just I was like, you know, it's weird, right? They kind of made Riker into Captain Kirk in a lot. Like Riker was like the Captain Kirk analog for that show. Yeah. But instead of being in charge, he was like second in command. But like they pretty much feel the same function because Riker would bang anything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, I love Jonathan Frakes, but yeah. So it, it's funny that she that Felicia Hart is not even in this story. You think they would found a way to to incorporate her, if for no other reason, to have like Gwen or, or Mary Jane be jealous? I. You know, I'm also surprised. I kind of, I think that maybe if I reread this, I might leave myself a little like post-it note or something that to scan the background of every single panel and see if I can't like find her doing something in the background. Because yeah, now that now that we've mentioned it, it seems a little weird for her to not be there. Um, so what? I mean, like with your limited knowledge, what? What is your favorite story that they adapted to try to make sense into this world? What famous Marvel story did you like that they adapted into? Um, I really liked... Um, okay, so this might sound a little funny, but I really liked that they did the stuff with the clones... Right. Um, okay. Because I remembered that from the cartoon in the nineties. Yeah. And I remember that being sort of one of the earlier examples of like an episodic story told over multiple episodes. Um and I remember being so excited when they brought MJ back and then it being like, no, she's a clone. Um I so I kind of like that they worked that into the story and had it come in and out a few times. Um, it, I also really like the character Craven. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I feel like he's just a fun one to draw. Craven is cool. They, <laughs> I love how they recreated like that famous like cover of Spider Man busting out the grave mm. in his black suit, but instead of like a regular bat, black suit in this version is Venom. Mm -hmm. Like, he just becomes Venom. Like, there's no Eddie Brock, but Venom still shows up. Yeah. You, you, you know what this story reminds me of? Small tangent. It reminds me of Dragon Ball Z, Amanda. I mean, everything does. This is uh, the Comic Book Club podcast uh you know, rule number 12 or something is that if we're speaking for more than an hour, we have to talk about Dragon Ball Z once. So that, so you know how the Dragon Ball movies don't uh, don't necessarily, like, are, are in continuity with the show, right? Right. So there's a movie where Trunks is a kid, and, like, I won't go into the whole story, but by, by, by the end of the story, he's still a little kid Trunks, right? Mm -hmm. By the end of the story, story he gets a sword. Mm -hmm. So my nephew, who was younger at the time, said, "Oh well, clearly this fits in with the, with the, with the, with the terrible timeline. Like you know, with like the androids take. Like no, it doesn't. This fits more in the regular timeline, even though it's not a part of it. But he got the sword. Like no, what this story is saying is, no matter what, no matter the timeline, no matter what happens." Trunk will always end up with a sword. No matter the universe, no matter the timeline, Trunk, Trunks will always end up with a sword. I feel that way about a lot of the stories in, in this in, 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 in this Spider-Man book, right? Venom is always going to happen, no matter the universe. It may not always it may not be Eddie Brock every time, but best believe Venom is going to happen. I agree with you very much. That is absolutely the vibe I'm getting. Um, I would say another another anime comparison would be, you know, 
in every Gundam series, you've always got the villain who's kind of an anti-hero with the mask. Right. Um, like, there's always a charred noble, there's always um, a Zex Marquis, there's always that guy. Right. Um, and this is kind of the Spider-Man version of that. This is kind of the boiled down, distilled, we need, what? Are, what is the core essence of Spider-Man and how do you dishwasher load it into one story? Um... And again, it it just it, it's interesting. Like just like they do, they they find a way to do civil war mm-hmm. in this story. And Tony even more of a dickhead than he was in that story. <laughs> I I didn't even know that was possible. That's kind of what I was saying about. I feel like Zardsky also wrote like the the Tony Stark version of this story too. Right. Explaining how we get to like turbo asshole Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I, I've always said like you know what I'm with I, I, I've always said I think I would fall on the Iron Man side of this argument just because you can have like these crazy you can have all these untrained people running around with powers man Zardusky version of the story made me really rethink my um stance on that because <laughs> <laughs> he's even worse yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it's okay for your answer in Civil War to be, I agree with you, but you're an asshole, so I'm not going to, like, because, like, like, it's one thing to, like, you know, register, and then it's another thing to, like, team up with Iron Man. <laughs> it's one thing to register, then there's another thing to, like, you know, team up with supervillains all of a sudden, right? Yeah, so- yeah. <laughs> Like, look, I just put this dude in jail. Now you want me to work with him to take down Captain America? Are you crazy? <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, uh, what else can we talk I, I guess we should talk about, they actually pull off the Superior Spider-Man storyline. They do, and that disappointed me just slightly. Really? Because- well, because we only really had Miles for, what, like, five pages total, and four yeah. of them, he's technically Doc Ock. Pretty much. So, that was a that was a little bit disappointing, just because I would rather have seen more Miles, but I'm glad that they snuck it in there, and I don't know how else he could have fit it in. And it makes sense that it's there since, like, that was, like, the last big... I mean, it's 10 years old at this point, right? But that was, like, the last big memorable Spider-Man story. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So it makes sense that it's there. Yes. But, yeah, yeah, I, I would have enjoyed more Miles. I, I'm, 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 I'm happy that they snuck Miles in there. I'm like, oh, okay. So so we're, we're, we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and honestly, I did really love the vibe of that last story. It was very Batman Beyond with old man Peter Parker coaching Miles. Right. Um. Old man Parker. Yeah. (laughs) No, I, I really, um, I, (laughs) I, I can't, I'm still, I'm sorry. We're getting so distracted today. I can't believe we don't have a Batman Beyond movie. <laughs> I can't believe that that's and never we, happened. And Michael Keaton is still alive, and we don't have a Batman. We literally have the perfect old Bruce Wayne. It was the original Bruce Wayne. He's right there. He's... <laughs> yeah, I... Like, Make him old man. Look, get that get that nigga a cane and a and a and a giant basset hound and cast some pretty power lip Asian as Terry McGinnis and let's get this started. Damn it! <laughs> I'm sorry. I um, I mean, I think we might. I mean that that dynamic was in Spider Verse just a little bit. Right. And I, um, it's just such a fun way to tell a story i'm just surprised that we haven't seen it more um hey at this point they just throwing everything at the wall they gotta be thinking well look he's he's gonna show 
Michael King Batman is going to show up in the new Flash movie. Maybe they can use that as, as a spinoff point. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like they got to hear the people because that's what the people want, right? They yes. Have, <laughs> they have to hear it, right? They, they, they know what the people want. They want Batman Beyond and they want Michael Keaton's old man Batman. Just give it to us. Oh, this is this is this is what the people want. Okay, so we want we want old Batman training a younger guy. We want old scientists. We want young women. We want uh, uh, we want to. Can we throw Mysterio in there? Um, uh, what else can we throw into this grab bag? What else do the people want? Um, Baby by Yoda. The way, <laughs> by the way, Mysterio was so good in, in the second Spider Man movie that. That was perfect. That it was. was that was a great update to that character. Did you know Jack hate this Spider Man? Like he really hates this Spider Man. He hates this version of Spider Man so much. I think it's hilarious. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, it just like you know how much money I would pay to see Ma- Michael Keaton in the first ten minutes of the movie in that Batman Beyond suit before he realized he can't do it anymore. Ah. Uh. Just- just give me one scene of him in that Batman Beyond suit fighting. Just one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Then, like, at the end of the movie, he can, like, strap on the old Batman suit because somehow Terry's suit don't fail him and Terry about to die. And, and like, like old Batman got come in all analog and shit. <laughs> and with the dogs, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I think maybe... A great way to summarize ooh, 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 this. Ooh, ooh, okay, what ooh, else? Ooh, one more. Okay, so Batman Beyond movie, right, should uh-huh. definitely take place in the Tim Burton Batman universe. And since Michael Goff, the guy that played Alfred is dead, there should be like a giant picture of Michael Goff in Wayne Manor in the Batman Beyond movie. And when Terry asks, who is that? And you just like the man that raised me or some shit like that, it would be so fucking awesome. Ugh. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know I hate fan fishing, and here I am. But go ahead. <laughs> okay, but so maybe that's the best way to summarize this story, though, is that this is the best possible version of fan fiction, and this is a story that gets you excited about comic books in general. Right. Right. Um. Yeah. I. I would say I would actually. I. Pr- okay. I promise this. I solemnly swear. The next time I see somebody shitting all over fan fiction just for being fan fiction, I will throw this story at them and be, hey, look, this is an example of fan fiction not sucking. So so basically you'll be throwing the book at me. That's fine. I, I deserve it. Another good example of good fan fiction, believe it or not, is Creed. Creed was fan fiction. It was Ryan Coogler's fan yeah. fiction in high school. Okay, yeah. And he got to make it, basically. Like, he got to make it a reality. Yeah. I mean, usually if someone's if usually if someone's criticizing fan fiction, they're making a point about it being indulgent without any, like, redeeming qualities. Right. So usually what they're trying to say is that it's, it's poorly written. <laughs> um... Which well, I think people should just say instead of trying to pin the issue on it being, you know, borrowing existing characters or something. Oh, no, it's not even that. Like, I get that to an extent. No, no, no what? We, we're going to a whole nother tangent. I'm, I'm not even. No, never mind. The best, the best stories make us talk about things that aren't in the books. I stand by that. Yes, Go they ahead. do. Yes, they do. No, I'm just going to say the problem, I think, is. Like, you know, the people that used to write in live journal like like fifteen years ago uh-huh. they found Tumblr and with all their weird with all their weird kinks and shit. And like I feel like sometimes those people, those type of fan fiction writers, those type that type of fandom, the Tumblr girl, as we like to call, it, like kind of ruin books sometimes. Okay. Like like not necessarily ruin books, but kind of like makes the fandom weird in a weird way. Like not having more women or not having more queer people, that's fine. But I feel like the Tumblr people are a special type of weird. 
and I feel like sometimes they're very loud. <laughs> so your problem isn't necessarily with fan fiction. It's with what, what we were just doing, which is demanding that the mainstream continuity follow our whims. Right, exactly. In, in and, way, and also kind of assuming that what we want is universal. Yes. In, in, yes, in a way, yeah. Like like the people that got done in case because, you know, Venom and um and Eddie Brock didn't have a sexual relationship. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's a real thing. That's, <laughs> yep, I, that's, that, uh-huh. that's a real thing. <laughs> but like, you know, but you know, also, but it's that weird thing where like also those people are like the people they make Spider Gwen like famous, which is cool, you know what I'm saying? But like you said, she's just a suit. Like <laughs> she's really just a suit. But like I like I credit Tumblr people with like making her fame. I credit Tumblr people with a lot with making a lot of these hero famous. Like, like, I don't think Camilla Khan wouldn't survive without, like, a strong Tumblr presence. I think a lot of these characters, and they're great characters, don't get me wrong, but, like, I do think sometimes Tumblr people are a little, a little weird. Just, that, that's all. And, like, you know what? Fan fiction is terrible. A lot of it is terrible. But somehow you can still make money off of it. Remember, remember, Fifty Shades of Grey is Twilight fan fiction. Yep. I got quotes like like every time I feel like I'm worthless and I'm having a creative block and I don't want to do anything like 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 I like I'm just gonna throw all this shit away. I read excerpts from that book to remind me that I'm not this terrible and that oh. this lady can make and this I, lady can make, and this I, lady can make money. I can make money too. I mean, I just finished NaNoWriMo, and I perhaps should have taken a break halfway through to remind myself of that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Of what? I should have taken a break halfway through to remind myself that it doesn't have to be good. <laughs> it doesn't have to be good. <laughs> like, sometimes you can just do it, and if you just find enough people to like your shit, that's all it takes. Like, there's excerpts from that book about happy beavers and perky buttholes and just all type of weird lines and I just and I, I just have them saved in my phone and I read them sometimes when I had like writer's block or something like this is terrible but it's not this terrible so I'm okay <laughs> anyway Amanda we have gone on way too many tangents I'm gonna leave all this in cause I don't feel like really editing this shit tonight or ever really okay so just, that's fine so, so all this is going up warts and all tonight I think that's great. In- including the conversation w- I had with Miss Cynthia about old people. <laughs> I love Miss Cynthia. I She is our new mascot. Yes, yes. I think I'm going to leave all this in. So, Amanda, <laughs> would you recommend this book? You know, I'm having trouble imagining circumstances where I wouldn't recommend this book. Right, right. You know, know what? There's one more thing we need to talk about. We talked about it a little bit. What do you think of the art? Oh, the art is great. The art is like when I close my eyes and imagine a comic book, this is what it looks like. So do you know who Mark Bagley is? A little bit. Um, I definitely am familiar with the name. I feel like I've maybe seen, I don't know, maybe covers or something that he's done but i think this is the first book i've read that he did mark like i said like like i said in the intro like mark bagley to me is the spider-man artist he's basically been drawing spider-man since the mid 90s one way or another then like he got ultimate spider-man with Brian michael bennis and they did like 102 issues of that together. They wanted to beat Jack and uh, they they wanted to beat um, what was it? Um, they they wanted to beat Jack and um, Stan on the Fantastic Four. I think they did like 101 issues, and I think they wanted to do 102 just so they could be like the longest creative team on a book together. Okay, yeah, I I definitely have some of the Ultimate Spider-Man stuff here. 
Yeah. So that so, makes sense. So like he's he's great. Like that's all I have to say. Like his Spider Man is what I think of Spider Man in my head a lot of the times. Like he's my Spider Man artist, and like you said, the art is great. I, I wish he could draw Spider Man forever. So like I said, you do recommend this book, correct? Yes, I recommend this book. I mean, like like I may have difficulties. It if it everyone should be thankful that we're all trying to stay home. Otherwise, I would be like going out to the grocery store and just like handing out post-it notes to people reminding them to read this book. Like I'd just be standing there with my Kindle going, look, look at the Spider-Man. Look at the Spider-Man. Look at the Spider-Man. Okay. So Amanda. What about you? Oh, 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 definitely. I mean, like, <laughs> but is this the first Spider-Man story have, we've read for this show? Um, I think so. I think we... How the hell is that possible? We've read like a million Batman stories. Uh huh. <laughs> How have we not read a Spider-Man story? It's it's for what I said at the beginning, which is that Marvel doesn't frequently give us books that you can pick up and read the whole story in a week and then be done. Okay, good point. Like we did, we did the X-Men ones that we could, that were yes. like that. And yeah, there just aren't really. That's that's just Marvel less frequently does that. Um, right. <laughs> okay, so, like, New Year's resolution. We, we gotta do more Spider-Man stories. <laughs> okay. We, we, like, like that, that's nuts. That's really crazy that this is our first Spider-Man story. Now, Amanda, what are we reading in, like, a couple of weeks? Because I think we, I think, like, we're, we're supposed to have a show out technically next week. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think it's gonna happen. Because it, because th- this is a big one, uh, this says four hundred thirty one pages. Yeah, so I, I may I might need a little time. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 this one might throw the schedule off for just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Amanda, what are we reading um, next time? Whenever that may be. Uh, so uh, copy pasted into my notepad, I've got here Star Wars: Heir to the Empire. The Thrawn trilogy, actually, it's the yeah, it's the twenty four ninety nine book. It's the I think the whole thing is called Heir to the Empire. Oh, or no, 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 that's just the first half. No, we are reading all three books. So that's that's basically a trilogies of, of of six issues a piece. Okay. So that's what. So the reason we're reading Star Wars is because of that of that lost conversation I had to cut out. Mm-hmm. So it's so. Audience has spent a very long episode discussing Star Wars before we even get to the book. Because I think me and Amanda, look, me and Amanda, me and me and Amanda never fight. We never argue. <laughs> Talking about Star Wars is the only time I think we've ever came to something resembling an argument. And it wasn't even an argument, but it's the closest we've ever came. To- <laughs> oh, and it was hilarious too because the the part we disagreed about was how popular we think it is with other people. Right. Like, <laughs> like, we're, like, we're both like, yeah, Star Wars is great. And you're like, everybody who's cool likes Star Wars. And I'm like, no, there's like three cool people who don't like Star Wars. And you're like, no, that's not possible. And it was just like, well, I know some people who don't like Star Wars. I'm like, well, no. Well, I, well I, then they're I, not I, cool. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was stupid. But it was also a lot of good insight in there. But it... it it was an hour and a half long, though. It, like before we even got to the book, it was a, it was one of those times we ain't talked to each other in like three weeks. Yeah, and we and we had a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, quick question: um, Did you read the Thrawn trilogy, like the books? No, no. Okay. No, I I have a story about that next week because there's there's a story behind why I haven't read it. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Because I I definitely read them. And oh, 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 I bet you did. I'm sure you did. So, so no. Well, I'm just is, I'm just wondering if I should try to reread them. The books and the comic. Yeah. How much time are you going to need, Amanda? Jesus okay. Christ. I I read I read these books in elementary school, like one every weekend. 
So, like, okay. I should be able to read them fast. Like, they're not, like, you don't have to, like, pay attention to them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, look, if there's something you want to do, go ahead. In fact, that'll be an interesting conversation because then you, you can compare it as a um, as an adaptation more than I can. Yeah. So that, that, that'd be an interesting aspect. Again, I'm leaving all this in. I'm I'm leaving all the talking. Yeah, shopping. no, no, this is fine. Um, I will I will think about it. I mean, now that I've said it and it's going to be in the episode, I think I have to do it, right? Right, right. But again, expect a lot of Star Wars talk. Amanda, I'm telling you right now, I took some unfair. So look, part of this conversation about what Star Wars movies were popular and which ones wasn't, right? I've actually been taking like unofficial like. Like very unofficial, very, very not official like polls <laughs> about what Star Wars movies people like. Mm. And, and like 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 I think the results would be interesting. I think the results but like like yeah, so we spent a lot of Star Wars talk and then after that we never have to talk about Star Wars again, hopefully. All right. Yeah. So Amanda, if they want to reach us and talk to us about Spider Man, I, I can think of nothing funny. Uh, <laughs> what can they reach us? We are on Twitter as Comic Book Club 52. They could email us, Comic Book Club 52 at Gmail. And we're also on Facebook. And you and I are both personally on social media a little bit. Uh, if you're cool, you'll know how to find us. If you're not cool and you don't like Star Wars, go away. Right, 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 right. So. I think that's it for this week. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me for this. And until next time, I'm Jamil Payne. I'm Amanda Comey.